The Yale Broadcasting Company Portrait in Sound. Just how do you talk about the Yale Broadcasting Company? Well, if ever anything was, many things to many people, the Yale Broadcasting Stations are. To those who know it best, the Yale Broadcasting Company is a kaleidoscope of extracurricular memories. It may be the memory of a long evening spent deep within the bowels of Hendry Hall finishing that special project which could mean much toward gaining membership in the organization. To a member of the technical staff, it could be the memory of that moment of electronic ecstasy when a crumped compressor amplifier sprang back to life after many hours spent bent over a hot soldering gun. To a member of the business department, it could well be the memory of a sales success with a formerly unsaleable local merchant. To a member of the production department, it might well be the recollection of that smooth finished program which finally emerged after a heroic and lengthy stand at the tape splicing block on the Ampex. To all of us, it is the memory of moments of mirth, merriment, and the many other comradely ingredients which sparked station parties, meetings, and elections alike. But to those outside of the station membership, to those in the communities of Yale, New Haven, and Southern Connecticut, the Yale Broadcasting Company today represents one of the most extraordinarily diversified professional nonprofit student organizations literally to be found in the nation today. This sort of WIBC horn tooting and alumni puffery which I'm engaging in is not without a solid foundation. During the next 30 minutes, we'll be painting a portrait in sound designed very simply and frankly to show that the Yale Broadcasting Company can far more than hold its own while serving its members, the college community, the city community, and the southern Connecticut community. Ideas, entertainment, information. These are the commodities with which the Yale Broadcasting Company deals in terms of both its members and the community at large. Jeepers, creepers, jeepers, creepers, jeepers, creepers, when you get those eyes. WIBC was still a bawling closed-circuit radio baby when the Yale Sings program first took to the airwaves, presenting a weekly live concert by a different Yale singing group. Always quick to spot possible ways to defray station expenses, Enterprising Yale broadcasters thrust their microphones in front of the singing groups again in 1953. This time, the result was the first known long-playing record of a college singing group, a disc known as Yale Sings. From A to Z, imagination always lurked in the foreground of WIBC undertakings. A, in this case, could stand for Auden, the poet W.H. Auden, whose voice was heard in a 1957 tribute to Ezra Pound. Again, this broadcast was not transmitted beyond the carrier current confines of the campus. There are very few living poets, even if they are not conscious of having been influenced by Pound, who could say, well, my work would be exactly the same if Mr. Pound had never lived. The same year saw a closed circuit boon for serious music fans on the Yale campus as WIBCA, a second Yale broadcasting station, started its classical music turntable spinning with everything from Bach to Bartok. Now, since the purpose of WIBCA is to present the Yale campus with classical music, let us give you just a, a short demonstration of our new equipment here. National networks have been known to marry their resources with those of WIBC and the Yale stations for special tributes and presentations, such as this CBS broadcast. The World Tonight came to you tonight from the Yale University campus in New Haven, Connecticut. Originating from the studios of WYBC, the university student station. NBC's Miss Monitor even donned her ivy-covered cap for a coast-to-coast -coast salute to the Yale stations. Miss Monitor, Yale men take a very active interest in broadcasting, we understand. I should say they do. The Yale Broadcasting Company is comprised of three stations. One station plays only classical music, and another specializes in various programs of music in the jazz or popular vein. Both stations broadcast on a closed circuit to the Yale community only. But a third station, WYBC-FM, serves New Haven and Southern Connecticut. 
From what I've heard, the broadcast standards of all three operations are very high. A major turning point in the responsibilities and the opportunities of Yale broadcasters came when the boundaries of Yale Broadcasting Company coverage maps were suddenly pushed out to include all of Southern Connecticut. WIBC-FM, now broadcasting to suburban duplexes as well as college dormitories, received kudos, congratulations, and a civic pat on the back from New Haven's Mayor Richard C. Lee, who pointed out a number of roles the station could perform, including... WIBC-FM and AM, wholly student-operated, is broadcasting daily from Yale to New Haven, helping to create closer ties, mutual understanding through its fine programming, not the least of which are its educational programs, which are of inestimable help to the people of New Haven. And speaking of just the kinds of things Mayor Lee spoke about, i.e. relations between Yale and New Haven, who of those of us who were there in 1959 will ever be able to forget the famous snowball riot of 1959? The uproar, which managed to jump onto the pages of prominence in magazines and newspapers across the country, was naturally covered on the scene by the hustling Yale Broadcasting Company News Department. One cool-headed bystander who was interviewed staunchly maintained that there never was a riot. Well, sir, if I may say so, I, I wonder a little about the use of the word riot. Uh, I'm not sure that a riot did take place uh, on a Saturday afternoon. It seemed to me that rather you had a confrontation between the police and the students after a parade, uh, which was turned uh, into police charges. Using WIBC as his mouthpiece, Yale's President Griswold made haste to read the Riot Act to the students. Gentlemen, for the second time in three days, Yale undergraduates have disregarded the rights of their fellow citizens and have failed to live up to their responsibilities as members of the community. On a somewhat more cerebral plane, the Yale broadcasting stations are frequently able to dip into an invitingly rich source of program material which consistently lies in wait in regular organized campus activities, colloquiums, and other enlightened discussions which often bring to the campus noted guests who speak authoritatively on everything from modern art to modern politics. The roster of voices heard on WIBC in recent years reads like a veritable international who's who. Whether the topic being discussed is the use of red in modern art or the admission of red China to the United Nations in modern politics, the Yale Broadcasting Company is there using its microphones to spread lux et veritas. Speaking on the Red Chinese admission, by the way, was recent challenge colloquium visitor Carlos Romulo. Am I or am not, I not in favor of the admission of Red China in the United Nations? That's the first question. I'm not. And I'll tell you why. Broadcast history was made in one of the more delicate electronic operations of recent WIBC history. The event was a live transatlantic debate between the Yale and Cambridge debating team. Despite the fact that the verbal battle took place via underwater cables, dry English humor came across the Atlantic undampened. Hello Yale, welcome to Cambridge. I hope you can hear us well. We're very glad to be able to debate with you this year. We debated with Harvard last year and I hope that your exams have gone well. <laughs> I... The parade of personalities visiting the campus more than occasionally ranges to the controversial. Thus, the Yale Broadcasting Stations have become the listening post for students and community citizens alike for comprehensive coverage of university guests. When the occasion and the guest permit, Station members have always made an effort to get visitors to take five from their schedule of class appearances and speaking engagements to come to the studio for interviews. The charms of one recent WIBC chairman drew authoress Anne Rand into Studio 2 to discuss her reputed subscription to a philosophy of atheism. But an atheist is a somewhat negative lab label in the sense that it implies that we are out to fight against religion. That is not the point. We are out to fight for reason. 
Drawing from his repertoire of political haymakers, Richard Nixon, another recent visitor during the presidential campaigns of 1960, elected to endear himself to the students by a timely reference to the fighting bulldogs. Vice President, this is to the Yale audience, Vice President. Could you say something to our Yale audience? Yes, Yale. Yale. Yes. Well, I, I want to congratulate the Yale football team for its great record, 4 nothing, and... Uh, it looks like this is Yale's, uh, Yale's uh, year to win the Ivy League, right? When the fateful day for Nixon rolled around that November, the eyes of the nation were keeping score on one of the most exciting elections in recent years. The Yale Broadcasting Company was keeping score, too, enlisting the helping hands of nearly everyone in the station, plus alumni across the country and even abroad, where one famous red-headed Yale Broadcasting Company alumnus presented the European view of the election from Germany. WIBC personnel hit the road for such key listening points as Hartford, New York, and Hyannisport with live remote broadcasting equipment. We are now in Hyannis, Massachusetts, at the Kennedy headquarters, and this is John Anderson returning you to Election Central. <laughs> Historic speeches by the dozen have been carried live or on tape by the Yale Broadcasting Company. The words spoken have run the full course of human relations. Ralph McGill, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, spoke on 640 and 94.3 about race relations. What the American the Negro has been saying all along is that he does not wish to be regarded or recognized or officially designated as a minority group. Mrs. Indira Gandhi presented a profile of greatness to WIBC listeners as she accepted the Howland Prize awarded by President Griswold. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a pleasure and a privilege to be invited to this famous university and to deliver the Howland Memorial Lecture. And I thank you for the prize. In addition to turning their eyes upward toward the speaker's platform, WIBC News Department members are capable of turning them in almost any direction to cover almost any kind of a news event. With the twittering of birds in the background, members recently turned their eyes downward toward the foundation of the new Samuel F. B. Morse College, where a time capsule not to be opened until 300 years hence was interred to the accompaniment of these ceremonious words. Let me tell you, very briefly now what we propose to place in this large capsule on the corner. First of all, we have President Griswold's proposal for the new colleges and an exchange of correspondence between him and Mr. Whitney and between him and Mr. Mellon. Mr. Griswold's speeches and reports dealing with the college plan, a very elaborate and beautifully worked out tape of Sounds of Yale by our student radio station, WYBC. Nowhere, if not on the college campus, is the offbeat, the unusual, the weird, the way out, and the extraterrestrial to be found in such profusion. From the sublime to the, well, you know what, from the straight-laced parliamentary member to the bizarre king of the world, WIBC has seen and covered the visits of a lifetime of characters in its two decades of broadcasting. World King Homer Tomlinson had this to say, among other things. I was inspired in my youth to be a minister and uh, served in the church for peace on earth, as churches all serve. Uh, but in 1954, I felt uh, an inspiration that I was a king to bring peace on earth. This is the 24th university to which I've come, and uh, it will be a great experience to me this afternoon at uh, 4 o'clock to crown myself king of Yale University for good. 
In addition to guests, invited or uninvited, who spread their ideas before Yale audiences in formal appearances, WIBC invites its own guests to be heard, as was Joseph Hansen before a live WIBC studio audience and on the airwaves of the Yale Broadcasting Company. Hansen stirred a fast-swelling tide of reaction with his radio address. He is the former secretary to Leon Trotsky and presently editor of the socialist labor militant newspaper in New York City. I wish to begin by associating myself with the views expressed by the management of the station and the sponsors of this program. That uh, I am sure before I even begin that I may say some things that may stir the squeamish and will certainly arouse some opposition among many people. And I am convinced that the sponsors if not uh, violently opposed to what I may say. Controversy also echoed in the wake of another ambitious program typical of WIBC's imaginative initiative in broadcasting. The event was our live coverage of the Young Americans for Freedom conservative rally in Madison Square Garden. Exclusive coverage of the much-talked-about New York City rally belonged to two broadcasting facilities alone, the American Broadcasting Company and the Yale Broadcasting Company, in alphabetical order. Despite the task's time, toil, and trouble, there did come a moment in the rally when WIBC members felt suddenly warm all over as these words came from the giant loudspeakers over the Madison Square Garden stage. Thank you very, very much, Senator Thurman, for your fine address. At this time, the Young Americans for Freedom are pleased to thank the Yale Broadcasting Company for broadcasting this rally live to the citizens of Southern Connecticut and especially to the men of Yale. I hear a Harvard man in the rear. Not to be outcovered by any national network on this event, WIBC members braved crowd commotion and confusion to obtain interviews at risk of life and limb. Interviews like this one, exclusive with Barry Goldwater. Oh, no. well, Senator Goldwater, are you heartened by the uh, huge crowd here at Madison Square Garden? Well, I told the boys last year that I didn't think they could do it, but uh, evidently they've done it. I haven't been out to see how full the house is, but they tell me they've got quite a few out there. It looks like practically every seat is taken. Other names from other fields of endeavor? Well, there are practically as many of them as there are hours in a Yale Broadcasting Company week. John Sherman Cooper, the Reverend Martin Luther King, Governor Abraham Ribicoff, New York State redevelopment expert Robert Moses, MIT economist Paul Samuelson, and many, many others have all come to New Haven, only to find the familiar WIBC microphone logo in front of them wherever they go. When you get right down to it, there's hardly a major event or visitor who goes through the southern part of Connecticut without encountering the Yale Broadcasting Company's inquisitive coverage. Of course, the backbone of any broadcast day at WIBC, WIBCA, and WIBC-FM is not the spectacular speech, interview, or news scoop, but a solid core of varied programming appealing to virtually every conceivable taste and intellectual level. By its very nature, the large university radio station enjoys the unique never-never territory of broadcasting land by being able to experiment to broadcast just what it wants, pretty much just as it wants. WIBC has taken full advantage of this unique freedom to bring its listeners a full spectrum of programs which stretch the medium of sound to the very limits of its vast flexibility. At the top of the list in rank and file of routine WIBC programming are the Productions, special series of broadcasts aimed at fine-tooth combing a particular problem or set of problems. The Voice of Latin America series was one of these. Debo anunciar en forma oficial y en nombre del gobierno que tengo la honra de representar... I must announce officially 
On behalf of the government, I have the honor to represent that the Republic of Cuba was invaded this morning by a mercenary force which came from Guatemala and Florida and which was organized, financed, and armed by the government of the United States of America. The Threatening Cloud, Communism and Castroism, Part 3 of the Yale Broadcasting Company's production of The Voice of Latin America. Continuing our production based on Senator William Benton's The Voice of Latin America, we shall hear the voices of those who know the most about Latin America. Here now is Senator William Benton. U.S. baiting is an old story in Latin America. It began long before either Castro or communism appeared on the scene. The Political Union Forum was another series. Good evening. This is Roger Swabel, your moderator for Political Union Forum. This evening we are presenting the second in our series of informal political discussions uh, featuring members of the Yale Political Union. A strongly civic-minded series was calculated to dissect the redevelopment movement toward a new New Haven. And so my major contribution in a, in a summary sense has been that the apathy and the lethargy and the indifference which has marked New Haven for 50 years has been dissipated. And I think that's almost enough of a hallmark for any mayor to leave in a city. Right. Well, thank you, Mayor Lee. New Haven has been called a city of old elms and new ideas. There is much truth in that statement, for with new ideas and projects have come new problems. We are living in a new New Haven. The long-range interests of the United States are best served by communicating directly with the peoples of the world by radio. These were the words of Henry Loomis, director of the United States Information Agency's International Broadcasting Service, as he outlined the task confronting the voice of America. Good evening. This is Einer J. Westerland, and I'd like to welcome you to the sixth in our exciting series of programs entitled Insight. Insight is produced and presented by Perspective Productions of New Haven. In the coming weeks on Insight, you'll hear programs devoted to such vital issues as the Peace Corps, Disarmament, the Vanishing Reality, Civil Defense, and you, and finally, On Trial, the United Nations. Our cast includes authentic players, the men behind the history-making events of these times. Men like the President of the United States and outstanding national and international governmental figures at all levels. Naturally, there are always Yale men around nursing bad cases of footlight fever. Taking advantage of some of the many polished dramatic productions which sprout across the campus each school year, WIBC brings its listeners many of the plays which lend themselves to radio coverage. One recent performance which went out on our FM airwaves and campus closed circuitry was the Davenport College Players rendering of Dylan Thomas Difficult under the Milkwood Tree. This skull at your ear hole is? Curly Bevan, tell my aunt it was me that pawned the armor Lou Clark. Aye, aye, Curly. Tell my missus no, I never... I've never done what she said, I've never... Yes, they did. And who brings coconuts and shawls and parrots to my Gwen now? How is it above? Is there rum and lava bread? Bosoms and robins? Concertina? Ebenezer's bell? Fighting an onion? And sparrows and daisies? Fizzlers and a jam jar? Buttermilk and whippets? Rockabye baby? Washing on the line? And old girls in the snug? How's well, the tenors and doll eyes? Who milks the cows in my school? When she smiles, is there dimples? Radio Moscow presents Moscow Today. Listener comment applauded the WIBC's series, The Art of Propaganda, as no other program broadcast by the student station. The series focused on the analysis and uncut presentation of extremist propaganda from Radio Moscow. <laughs> Those of us who spent any time at all in front of a WIBC microphone during our four years there are candidly aware that much of the humor which is transmitted to the audience is unintentional. 
An effort toward intentional humor on WIBC finds the Yale Broadcasting Company calling on the Yale Record Magazine, the oldest college humor magazine, for occasional productions of the old Owl Show program. Uh, the delegates are joining hands, and I believe it's going to be a Virginia reel. The girls are really lovely in the pastoral colored gowns, and the, the orchestra has started. The delegates and their partners are... Uh, um, uh, things are getting a bit hectic, and there are shouts of fun and general gaiety. The delegates and their partners are joining hands again, and there's Button Gwinnett next to Thomas Jefferson in his day, hand in hand with Ben Franklin, cutting a fine figure. <laughs> And they uh, seem to be getting rather hectic here. Uh, the crowd is going, uh, is going uh, watch the mic cable. Watch the mic. No FM station worth its kilocycles would be caught without a programming diet heavy with classical music. But again, classical music as an important part of the WIBC FM way of life is presented with imagination. Classics by request typifies this imagination and enjoys the distinction of being the only classical music request program in Southern Connecticut. The hosts of the Yale Broadcasting Company's Beginnings of Music programs turn their heads backward for a weekly inquiry into the roots of all familiar serious music forms. Another broadcast invites listeners to spend an afternoon at the opera. Jazz addicts find good reason to dial to the Yale Broadcasting Company. You're in tune with the sound of jazz that, of course, pardon our progress, and I'm your host, Herb Roth. We continue with Thursday's musical matinee, The Little One, Jim Fisher, bringing you Matinee at the Nightclub, a special Thursday feature. With so many vocal quartets on the popular music scene today, it's kind of hard to choose one group and pick it out as the best. I guess about the safest foursome to pick out is the four lads. They've been on the pop music scene now for... Oh, eight years or so, an old group for this rags to riches and back to rags music field of today. Let's listen to it now, the four lads. I'm just breezing along with the breeze. Informed college fans and fanciers have found that the place to keep up on all the latest developments in the world of sports is WIBC. No matter what the season, Yale men and area citizens alike have increasingly turned to WIBC for all season play-by-play -play coverage Typical of this excerpt from a Colgate game. Goes back to pass. Trying to spot a man down. A long, long pass. He's got McKinnon in the open. The pass is caught by McKinnon. McKinnon's in the open. Down the 30, the 20, the 15, the 5. He's tackled from behind on the one-yard line. What a tremendous catch by Jacques McKinnon. The Colgate halfback who went down there. The pass was a 40-yard pass play that McKinnon caught on his own 20-yard line. Carried all the way down to the 2-yard line was finally tackled from behind by Kenny Wolf, but not before he had made a tremendous gain and put Colgate directly in scoring territory. Opinions make horse racing, it's been said, and members of the Yale Broadcasting Company may well testify that opinions make a good broadcasting operation. Opinions by the studio full managed to emerge from the loudspeakers of the Yale Broadcasting Company listeners' radio in a typical day. Amidst the morass of multi-subject opinions covered by WIBC, as voiced by campus visitors, professors, and students, it seemed only logical that the station itself should eventually develop a policy of making its feelings clear. Here is the chairman of the Yale Broadcasting Company with an editorial. Three times a week, editorials from the typewriters of the WIBC Executive Committee are broadcast. Repeatedly in this presentation, we've pointed out WIBC's programming propensity toward the imaginative, the unusual, and occasionally the bizarre and offbeat. Standing in the extreme fringes of the broadcasting spectrum of the offbeat is a program which can be considered only in a splinter category all by itself. The tomb program, hosted by the distant specter of the unknown spirit, copped top honors in the intercollegiate broadcasting system contest. And now, dearly beloved friend, the unknown spirit descends from the curtain of dark despair and most humbly presents the tomb. The time is 9.05 a.m. December 23rd, 1984. The scene is the Universal Mind Progress Building of the Department of Nothing. 
Oran L. Scrooge, Chairman and Chief Manipulator of the 106 Division, is working at his table model brain manipulator. Where is that fool Cratchit? 400 deviants to manipulate today, and he's already five minutes late. <laughs> The Yale Broadcasting Company, Portrait in Sound. This portrait is a patchy one at best, for with each new year, each executive board, and each new member, the potentials of the Yale Broadcasting Company flex and flow into new directions. It is nobody's station in particular, and everyone's station, the station of everyone who has had anything to do with it since its founding, well over 20 years ago, in general. Yes, the Yale Broadcasting Company has eloquently proved that it can more than hold its own while serving its members, the college community, the city community, and the Southern Connecticut community. The Yale Broadcasting Company Portrait in Sound was written and produced by Einar Westerlund, Yale 62.